Welcome back. Uh, we are here for lesson two or lecture two of my series in philosophy 101. So introduction to philosophy. And this is going to be the most centrally introductory lesson of this introductory course because today we're going to talk about what philosophy is. What are philosophers and what do they do? So last time we talked about the problem of skepticism. We looked at a few formulations of it, and uh, I hope to draw on some of what we talked about there in order to illustrate what philosophy is, because the problem of skepticism is, as I said, one of the classic and fundamental, really central core problems of philosophy. So by thinking about that and other problems, we'll be um, examining what philosophy is as a subject. I would be remiss not to begin this lecture with a little etymology. So the word philosophy comes from the ancient Greek roots, philo, meaning love, and sophia, meaning wisdom. So putting those together, we can infer that philosophy, at least in its original context, meant love of wisdom. And this really does embody at least one of the fundamental elements of philosophy. It is at root an inquiry. It's a search for things that are true and a search for how best to live. If that doesn't encapsulate wisdom, I don't know what does. Okay, but if philosophy is a love of wisdom, what exactly does it investigate? What is it really after? Here's a quote from one of my favorite philosophers, Bertrand Russell. He wrote this in the introduction to his famous A History of Western Philosophy. Here's how he understood it. Philosophy, he says, as I shall understand the word, is something intermediate between theology and science. Like theology, it consists of speculations on matters as to which definite knowledge has so far been unascertainable. But like science, it appeals to human reason rather than to authority, whether that of tradition or that of revelation. So here in the first part of the quote, the part that I think is most important and so I've put in bold, he tells us a little bit about the subject matter of philosophy, that is, it's similar to theology, so really deep questions about significance and value. But he says that it embodies the methods of science, appealing to human reason rather than authority or scripture. Okay, let's move on to the next part. He says, all definite knowledge, so I should contend, belongs to science. All dogma as to what surpasses definite knowledge belongs to theology. But between theology and science, there is a no man's land, exposed to attack from both sides. This no man's land is philosophy. Almost all the questions of most interest to speculative minds are such as science cannot answer and the confident answers of theologians no longer seem so convincing as they did in former centuries. So Russell, as you may be able to tell from this quote, was antagonistic to religion, and he was in fact a famous atheist. But so however we want to understand philosophy in relation to religion, atheistically or not, I think Russell does a nice job here of capturing what it is that philosophy is really doing or what it's all about. It does address itself to similar questions as religion, like questions about morality, but it doesn't rely on texts like the Bible to answer those things for us. It relies on reason and argumentation and other sources of evidence that we can use to answer those questions in as rational and, and non-dogmatic a way as possible. 
Now, that's not to say that there is no place for the Bible or other religious scriptures in philosophy. Certainly, those texts sparked philosophical inquiry for centuries. But a philosopher wouldn't be able to answer a philosophical question by simply saying that the Bible says a certain thing is true. A philosopher would need more argumentation than that, perhaps an argument for why the Bible is trustworthy for these sorts of matters. And it very well might be. It's just that a philosophical argument would need to provide good evidence and reasons for thinking that. Okay, so let's put the methods of philosophy aside for a second and think now about its subject matter, really what its content is and what it's investigating. Here's a list of questions that you might think of as just fundamental questions about the human condition. These are really deep questions um, that are really significant and important to us. And how we answer them impacts a number of things. In some cases, it impacts everything or almost everything. So for instance, in the last lecture, we talked about skepticism and whether we have any knowledge at all. That's a really deep and fundamental question. You can see how sweeping it is and our answer to it affects so many things in our lives. A lot of philosophical questions have this sort of property. So this list comes from Thomas Nagel in his introductory textbook, What Does It All Mean? You can find it on page six. I'll read them for you. Is knowledge of the world beyond our minds possible? That's the question that we discussed in the first lecture. Next, what is the relation between the mind and the brain? This is a classic question in a branch of philosophy called metaphysics, which investigates what kinds of things exist in the world. So one question is, well, we know minds exist and we know brains exist, but how do they influence one another? How does consciousness arise from the brain? We'll deal with that question in a later lecture in this course. Next question. How does a word become meaningful? How is it that some string of letters can come to refer to something other than itself? How is it that a sound spoken like this one can produce thoughts in your mind that refer to other things? Do we have free will? Where does morality come from? Which kinds of inequalities in society are unjust? And finally, is there meaning in life? These are some of the core philosophical questions, questions that have been investigated for millennia. Now, there's something really important that I want you to notice about these questions. They pervade basically everything we do, right? Every human action and human thought really does sort of have bearing on these sorts of questions. We make assumptions every day in our lives to justify the things that we do and the things that we believe. And those sorts of assumptions are philosophical. So we get out of bed in the morning because we presume that we're pursuing a life of value. We are careful about what we say and do to one another because we think that other people matter and that they have a sort of intrinsic moral worth. But some people, nihilists, question whether there is such a thing as morality. We assume that certain things exist, like objects and minds and God, and all of those are philosophical assumptions. But what's so cool about all of this is this kind of content, this kind of philosophical content, 
pervades everything. So I want to bet to you that every movie you've ever seen, every story you've ever read, every TV show you've ever watched, and really everything you've ever done or thought about in your life has some sort of philosophical undergirding, some sort of philosophical undercurrent that um, it's touching on or that it's raising. Um, and that's what makes these sorts of things so interesting. And that's what makes, I think, philosophy so interesting is, is that it underlies all of these things. It pervades them and it's constantly coming up in all aspects of human life. For instance, check out this clip of Game of Thrones where Tyrion Lannister, spoiler alert, I should say, spoiler alert, where Tyrion Lannister kills his father. It raises a deep philosophical question about desert, right? Tyrion's father treated him horribly all his life, and his father, in fact, sent sentenced him to death. So the question is, could anyone be such a horrible father to his son that the son would be justified in killing him? This is a deep moral question. Even if the father deserves to die, is it really the son's place to carry it out? Carry on. Put down the crossbow. Who released you? Your brother, I expect, he always had a soft spot for you. No, we're going to talk in my chambers. This is how you want to speak to me. Shaming your father has always given you pleasure. All that? my life, you've wanted me dead. Yes, but you refuse to die. I respect that. Even admire it. You fight for what's yours. You're my son. Now, enough of this nonsense. I am your son, and you sentenced me to die. You knew I didn't poison Joffrey, but you sentenced me all the same. Why? Enough. We'll go back to my chambers and speak with some dignity. I can't go back. Oh. Of course, this makes for great TV, and the audience is rooting Tyrion on the whole time. But are we right to be rooting him on? Might individuals have special obligations to their family members, even if their family members are so horrible to them that they would never be justified in harming them in the way that Tyrion harms his father? Of course, there are countless other, more common examples. Questions about how you should live your life. I'm sure that all of you, most people in the world, have at some point taken a step back to think about what they should be doing in life. And philosophical reflection is an attempt to systematically and carefully and thoroughly answer really important questions like that. So this brings us to another characteristic of philosophy, another fundamental element at the core of what philosophy is as a subject. Philosophers seek systematicity. They want to know how everything relates to everything else. 
So I think this is really well captured by a quote from a famous philosopher named Wilfred Sellers. He famously said, The aim of philosophy abstractly formulated is to understand how things, in the broadest possible sense of the term, hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. So what he's really saying here is that philosophers are interested in how the entire world works and how it all fits together. Everything is implicated by everything else or it relates to everything else in some sort of way. And philosophers seek to discover those sorts of relationships um, and sort of understand the, the ultimate framework of reality into which everything fits. So I have a few examples here to demonstrate the sorts of implications or the sorts of connections that philosophers are interested in. Here's one. If we have no free will, what does that mean for morality? So the first part of this question about free will is a metaphysical question asking about what powers or abilities humans really have. And the second part has to do with value and what the absence of free will would mean for value and for moral responsibility, as the question is usually put. Here's another one. If machines could be conscious, so if we could build conscious computers, would they have rights? Would they be ethically important in the way that humans or animals are. And we see, once again, that these kinds of issues aren't so r rare as we might originally believe. What we do here is complicated. For three years we lived here in the park, refining the host before a single guest set foot inside. Myself, a team of engineers, and my partner. You had a partner? Yeah. When the legend becomes fact, you print the legend. My business partners were more than happy to scrub him from the records, and I suppose I didn't discourage them. His name was Arnold. Those early years were glorious. No guests, no board meetings, just pure creation. began to pass the Turing test after the first year. But there wasn't enough for Arnold. He, he wasn't interested in the appearance of intellect, of wit. No, he wanted the real thing. He wanted to create consciousness. He imagined it as a pyramid. See? Memory. Improvisation, self-interest. And at the top? Never got that. But he had a notion of what it might be. He based it on a theory of consciousness called the bicameral mind. The idea that primitive man believed his thoughts to be the voice of the gods. I thought it was debunked. Not as a theory for understanding the human mind, perhaps, but not as a blueprint for building an artificial one. See, Arnold built a version of their cognition in which the hosts heard their programming as a, an inner monologue with the hopes that in time their own voice would take over. It was a way to bootstrap consciousness. But Arnold hadn't considered two things. One, that in this place the last thing you want the hosts to be is conscious. And two, the other group who considered their thoughts to be the voices of the gods. <laughs> Lunatics. Indeed. So we abandoned the approach. The only vestiges that remain are the voice commands we use to control them. But for all his brilliance, I don't think Arnold understood what this place was going to be. You see, the guests enjoy power. They cannot indulge it in the outside world, so they come here. And as for the hosts, the least we can do is make them forget. But some of them are remembering. 
accessing fragments of Arnold's code. Notice how this clever clip from Westworld raises ethical questions about the robots. If they can suffer, perhaps we shouldn't be building them in this way. Uh, perhaps we're doing something wrong. Uh, but again, they're computers. So philosophy would seek to understand what's going on here. And finally, how should we respond to the injustices of our society? What would be the best ways of dealing with those unjust aspects? All of these are philosophical questions that raise these interrelated aspects of the world. Philosophers look for these sorts of relationships and questions and connections and try to draw out what should be concluded from them. By the way, we might not be so far away from that Westworld stuff as you might at first believe. The world was paying a lot of attention and we weren't quite used to that. Chess events never get covered like that. It was probably the biggest news coverage for our chess match ever. We were trying to prove that it was possible to build a chess machine that could be the best human player in the world. It's also challenging Kasparov in any way. I mean, he's the pinnacle of chess. He would, he's an incredible genius. There were people who, even if just a few years before, said it was going to take decades to do. The chess world all expected Kasparov to win because the human had always won before. We worked very hard in the intervening year uh, to improve Deep Blue in, in various ways. I spent a lot of time in the office playing a lot of practice games, uh, looking for lots of errors that needed to be fixed. And, and we were pretty confident that it would do better. But then we got to the match. That was the chance to see, did we make a difference? Gary Kasparov has arrived. He was under tremendous stress, I, I imagine. The program wasn't behaving the way he was expecting. He thought that he was going to figure out the computer. And he, he wasn't mentally prepared for it, I think. I mean, the whole game was surreal. What was he doing? It didn't really make any sense. Whoa! Deep Blue has instantly sacrificed with Night Capture's E6. Deep Blue was just sitting there and just keep on attacking, just moving pieces around. And he knew he was in trouble. But at the end, Kasparov just, he stands up, he starts gesturing, he looks over at his mother. I, I think having your mother in the room where you're playing it important chess game is not a great idea as much as I love my mom. I was dumbfounded and elated at the same time. Uh, I was dumbfounded because I never s s see him behave that way. He never imagined the world champion and actually somebody who I have great respect to be just raising his hand up in, sus in surrender. We, we demonstrated that there are multiple approaches to solving probably any intellectual problem. But back then it wasn't the case. Everybody would look at the computer and say, well, yeah, it's good at some things. It, it calculates, but it doesn't understand anything. I work on this for 12 years. So you can imagine how, how much energy went into it. When I started, I always thought it, it was done in five to 10 years. I was wrong, it, take, it took 12, so. I, I was glad it was over. Okay, now another really cool thing about philosophy that I want to discuss, or at least claim, is that it is the origin of every academic discipline. Every discipline of inquiry and research, every discipline taught in universities originates in philosophy. If you look at the history of various disciplines, they begin in philosophy until they gain enough, what I say here, intellectual momentum to qualify or to become their own discipline. 
Now, what I mean really or usually happens here is disciplines um, become amenable to empirical inquiry. And so once they do, once we can perform experiments and observations in order to, dis to discover things, uh, those disciplines become their own field or those ideas, those views or um, kinds of investigations. They spin off from philosophy and become their own field. Now, just as an aside here, I think it's really fun to do a sort of experiment on Wikipedia. I've heard that repeatedly clicking on the first link of most Wikipedia articles, so the first word that is um, in blue, that is, that takes you to another article, right? Um, repeatedly clicking on that link will eventually take you to philosophy. And I've heard that that uh, is the case in almost, uh, in, for almost all articles. Uh, I haven't tested that myself, obviously, but uh, I invite you to do so. And I think that that sort of lends itself to my point here is that there is some way in which um, everything sort of traces back to philosophy, especially when it comes to fields of inquiry and research. And I want to prove it to you with a few articles from Wikipedia. So here, this first article is on psychology. And psychology, of course, uh, traces its history back to philosophy. And I invite you to read the, about the history of psychology. And you'll see here that um, it originates in philosophy and philosophical discussions about the mind and mental states and, and emotions and other uh, phenomena that we normally think of as purely psychological now. Here's the Wikipedia article on linguistics. And, of course, lo and behold, it says here that early grammarians and early interest in language was a part of philosophy. The first insights into semantic theory were made by Plato in his dialogue called the Cratylus. Here's the Wikipedia article on physics. We see that physics has its origins in what was called natural philosophy. And uh, it began with pre-Socratic philosophers like Thales, who it says here rejected non-naturalistic explanations for natural phenomena and explained phenomena instead in terms of natural causes or natural substances. So, pretty cool aspect of philosophy. Most disciplines trace their historical origins to philosophy. Okay, and finally we're going to talk about the tool that philosophers use to perform their investigations into all the subject matter that we've been talking about. So that tool is argumentation. Philosophers use arguments. And no, I don't mean this kind of argument. Violence? The There's water? not as much violence oh, as... Really? Let me, wait, 26 wait, 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 wait. people Let me finish the killed. question, please. Let me finish the question, Two weeks please. ago, 26 people were killed I, I in a gunfight on the border. I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're A saying. mile away from where I went. I, under, I was there. I understand. That's not the question. The question is... Do we forget about that? No, I'm not forgetting about it. I'm asking you to clarify where you get your numbers because most of the uh, DEA crimes reporting statistics that we see... Instead, I mean these kinds of arguments arguments that harness considerations to give us reasons for believing certain things to be true. These kinds of arguments can occur without any heat or animosity. Uh, in fact, I often find them a lot of fun. So philosophers use these kinds of arguments to see how things hang together to see how certain considerations relate to other considerations and how some things might mean or indicate that other things are true. So I want to talk today about two different kinds of arguments, and mostly we're going to just talk about the first kind. So there are deductive arguments and inductive arguments. You might remember from our last lecture the problem of induction, which arises uh, when we're making inductive arguments. 
But that problem doesn't arise when we're talking about deductive arguments. So deductive arguments show how things hang together as a matter of logical necessity. They show what um, is entailed by certain things being true. That is to say, they show what must be true if other things are true. Here's an example of a deductive argument. If free will is an illusion, then there is no moral responsibility. That's the first sort of consideration or what philosophers call the first premise in this argument. The next premise is free will is an illusion. And so the conclusion of this argument says, therefore, there is no moral responsibility. The first premise is a conditional the second premise is an assertion of the truth of the antecedent of that conditional. That is the first part of that conditional. And then the conclusion is the consequent of that conditional about moral responsibility. So I'm going to go again into that vocabulary a little bit more in the next slide. But basically we see here that if these premises are true, that is, if free will really is an illusion, and, and if the conditional, that is the first premise, is true here, that is there is some sort of link between the illusion of free will and an absence of moral responsibility, then we see that the conclusion is logically entailed. It must be true. So this is a real way of seeing how things hang together. Right? We can come to conclusions about what's true based on these sorts of premises. And if these premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. I'm going to go into this in more detail in the next slide. But philosophers care a lot about deductive arguments because we can see, we can, we can deduce what sorts of things must be true based on the truth of other things. So it really helps us accomplish this goal of figuring out how things relate to one another and figure out how things hang together. Inductive arguments are also really interesting to philosophers, and insofar as philosophers take the results of the sciences seriously, they are relying on inductive arguments because as we discussed in the previous lecture, um, scientific inquiry is entirely an inductive process or mostly an inductive process. That is, it makes generalizations about the way the world is from limited observations. It generalizes about unobserved cases from the observed cases. It makes predictions, and it generalizes which patterns hold in the universe. Those are processes of induction or examples of inductive reasoning. And inductive arguments merely suggest how things hang together. They suggest what might be true, right? Of course, we could be wrong about these things, but we can amass evidence to suggest that certain things are true. Right, so here's an example. The latest Le neuroscience seems to suggest that free will is an illusion. There doesn't seem to be a sort of driver or agent inside of the brain anywhere. Rather, the brain seems to be a causal system just like any other causal system. Um, and so it doesn't seem to be free from the causal framework of reality. And therefore, it seems that free will is an illusion according to the evidence that we've um, amassed through our investigations here. Uh, we might conclude from this that we probably don't have moral responsibility, at least in a very robust sense. So I don't want you to worry too much about the details there about moral responsibility because we could teach an entire course on that in itself. Instead, I want to just focus here on the nature of the sort of induction that's going on. From observing the brain, 
theorizing about it, doing experiments with it, it seems like it's merely a causal mechanical system that isn't exempt from other causal interactions in the world. Therefore, we might conclude inductively that free will isn't something possessed by brains and our feeling of free will is an illusion. Again, we'll talk more about those details in a later class. Okay, so let's turn our attention exclusively to deductive arguments. Here is a very, very simple, very, very classic um, deductive argument that often comes up in introductory logic courses. So let's look at it. First premise, all humans are mortal. Second premise, Alicia is human. Conclusion, Alicia is mortal. Just from looking at this, you should be able to see pretty easily that if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. And we can sort of stipulate here that the premises are true, right? Look at number one, all humans are mortal. Although that is an inductively supported premise, it's true. No human has ever lived forever, and we have a lot of evidence to believe that every single human is going to die. So we can infer that number one is true. Uh, premise two, let's say that Alicia is um, my friend. Um, Alicia, and I know that Alicia is a human. She has the DNA of a human and all of the characteristics of humanity. So we know the premises are true. Um, the conclusion must follow from them. That makes the argument both valid and sound. So validity is a measure of the argument's logical structure. It has nothing to do with the truth of the premises, but it has everything to do with whether the conclusion follows logically from the premises. So in order to test the validity of an argument, we have to um, look at the relationship between the argument's premises and the argument's conclusion. An argument is valid only when, if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. There's a sort of logical connection that is had between the conclusion of the argument and its premises. It must be impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. So another way of putting this is that when an argument is valid, its conclusion is logically entailed or logically necessitated by the premises. We see that this argument is indeed valid. Soundness is a measure that um, encompasses validity, but it also depends on the truth of the premises themselves. So right in validity, we're not concerned with the truth of the premises. In soundness, we are concerned both with validity and with the truth of the premises. So an argument is sound when the premises are true and the argument is valid, making the conclusion necessarily true. Okay, the next point is really important, so be sure that you're paying attention. Now, it's really, really important to emphasize that these are technical, philosophical terms. When I say that an argument is valid, I'm not using that word in the typical colloquial way. I don't mean the argument is good or it sounds right. That's often what the term valid means when someone says to you, for instance, oh, that's a valid point. No, I'm not using the term that way. I'm using the term to indicate an argument's logical structure and the relationship between premises and conclusion. Similarly with the word sound, I'm not using this term to make a point about how the argument seems good or how a particular point seems good. That's often what we mean by soundness in everyday conversation. 
But no, here it's a technical philosophical jargon term, meaning or describing only arguments where the premises are true and the argument is valid. So therefore the conclusion of the argument is also true. Let's look at a few arguments to evaluate them for validity and soundness. Premise 1. All Skittles are purple. 2. All purple things are birds. Skittles are birds. That's the conclusion. In fact, this argument is valid. It's obviously not sound because both of the premises are false, but its logical structure is valid. If the premises were true, the conclusion would necessarily follow. Sometimes it helps to think of arguments in terms of Venn diagrams. And I should say that if you take a class in logic, you would deal with this subject matter in much more detail than I do here, where you'll be drawing Venn diagrams and really analyzing logical structure much more thoroughly than we can afford in an introductory class. But in any case, we can see that this first argument is valid by drawing Venn diagrams in this way. I've put Skittles, the set of Skittles, right, that blue circle at the center there, inside of the set of purple things. That's basically what the first premise is saying. It's saying that all Skittles fall within the set of purple things, right, because they're all purple. The second premise is saying that all purple things, the wider circle there, falls within the set of birds, which is the widest circle. So if all Skittles fall within the set of all purple things, and all purple things fall within the set of all birds, then we can see from these diagrams, from this diagram, that all Skittles must be birds. And we can see that the circle of Skittles falls entirely within the set of birds. Of course, we know that in reality, these diagrams are false because Skittles um, don't fall within the set of all purple things. And all purple things don't fall within the set of all birds. But if we assume the premises are true, we can see that the argument is logically valid. Right? So by drawing the premises out in this way, in Venn diagrams, we can see that the conclusion necessarily follows. Again, if the premises are stipulated to be true, if they are assumed to be true, it would be impossible, if they're assumed to be true, for the conclusion to be false. Okay, let's look at the next one. Premise one, all grass is green. Okay, so I draw here, um, the circle of grass falls entirely within the set of green things. Another way of uh, representing this premise would be to say, if something is grass, if X is grass, then it is green. It falls within the set of green things. Premise two, this T is green. Conclusion, this T is grass. Pause the video for a second and see if you can evaluate this argument on your own for validity and soundness. The argument, in fact, is invalid because the first premise says nothing about things that are not grass. And T could fall within the set of green things, but it could be outside of the grass circle. There's plenty of space there for something to be T and for it not to be grass. So the conclusion here is not necessitated by the premises. That makes this argument invalid. And therefore we can conclude that the argument is also not sound because in order for an argument to be sound, it has to be valid. Now there are plenty of other videos on YouTube that really go into validity and soundness um, in more detail than I do here, and they probably explain those concepts better than I do here. So I strongly encourage you to watch them. I'm gonna end today's lecture.
as we usually do with discussion questions. And I want you to have these prepared if you're taking a class with me. Um, so today's discussion questions revolve entirely around arguments. And I want you to look at the following arguments and evaluate them for validity and soundness. So you should be prepared to say whether the following three arguments are valid and sound. We'll go into these arguments um, thoroughly in class. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the second lecture, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Music